All right. I have just turned off my air conditioning for you, dear listener. I hate you. I won't forgive you for this, but I am going to press on and do today's episode of Heavy Hands. I'm Connor. That's Phil. Phil, is your house nice and cool today? Uh, it's a little stuffy, but I don't think it's quite the same as yours. I mean, I'm fully expecting you to just, like, slowly melt down over the course of this episode. Not psychologically, as I normally do, but physically, you mean? Oh, no, both, I'm assuming. Well, yeah, the one's a given, though. Welcome. Yeah, okay. (laughs) Welcome, listeners, to Heavy Hands. Smoothest intro yet, only getting better. We had, uh, UFC... 292 last weekend and uh nailed it you know perfect we (laughs) we we always get these main events just absolutely perfect i will say this i think at least i got the co-main event pick right with some some nuances correct and at least you got the main event uh, vibe right this was the trap fight yeah you got the vibe that Sean O'Malley was going to win and I had the sense to pick Zhang Weili otherwise yeah. we have a lot to talk about <laughs> that was uh, not fully expected on last week's episode uh, of course next week we have a fight night card which looks pretty solid um, Holloway versus a Korean Zombie don't absolutely love that fight, but I'm not finding it as like heartbreakingly terrible an idea as some other people either. Um, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna kick things off um, talking about UFC 292, which was um, awesome. Just a great card. Yeah, top to bottom, it was like relevant and interesting. Even the dominations were were like yeah. Uh, mostly, like, interesting dominations. Yeah, as you said, thanks to Neil Magny for giving us a reason to root against him so we could enjoy uh, fully an utterly one-sided beatdown on the main card against Ian Gary. But um, the big one is, of course, the main event. Sean O'Malley, Aljamain Sterling. We said we had to pick Aljo. I'm going to be honest, I did not like his approach. I don't think this is entirely down to this not being as uh, predictable a fight um, as we expected. I don't really know what Aljo's game plan was here. Uh, how do you feel about uh, about his performance? Um, yeah, I mean, so we basically said the main thing he has to do is... Try and replicate the Sandhagen game plan. Yeah. Push O'Malley into the cage and uh, take him down. And, yeah, he kind of didn't do that. Yeah. But also, at the same time, I think you mentioned that like it's entirely possible for Sterling will be able to safely take time off in this fight in a way that he, for example, couldn't against Jan. Sure. And I felt that was kind of true as well. Like, that was definitely coming forward in the match. Yeah. Because uh, that first round was a big old load of nothing. Yeah. But from Mostly from, like, both guys. From both guys, yeah. Sean O'Malley does not really like leading or taking the front foot. And because uh, Aljo didn't press him, yeah, he didn't really do anything to Aljo. He was, you know... Very cautious. He tried that front kick. He used a lot against Jan, and Aljo landed some low kicks, and that was pretty much all the action in the first round. Mm-hmm. Like I think Aljo ended up stealing the round because he forced O'Malley into the cage at the last minute and landed some arm pun- and like some arm punches from the clinch. Right, most of which did not even really land clean. Mm-hmm. I actually think you know probably the most significant strike of the round was an O'Malley body shot, which immediately had Sterling like backing up and yeah. looking very different. I remember that one. It uh, seemed but, to have affected him. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, judges aren't going to score that for you. <laughs> like, you should probably know 
uh, judges don't score body work. Yeah. Unless it's defense. Um, so yeah, you could argue that like uh, Sterling wanted to be safe. Uh, but uh, he he wasn't. I don't know, you know, about this one. Well, I think there's a, there's a difference between. So I think for me at least, these the, the co-main and the main event are two examples of how to be wrong about a fight. And <laughs> we're the, good at, we're good at providing those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like the the O'Malley one, we were like, this guy is, a, you know, this guy definitely deserves to be here. He's genuinely very good. We don't think he got robbed by pure Tian. He's extremely dangerous. Like uh, the way he will, the way he wins this fight is if he win, he lands a, you know, the shot of his life. Mm -hmm. This is essentially what happened. Yeah, don't really feel like the uh, nature of the pick is necessarily super wrong. No, like, no, that's just the the outcome of the fight. I didn't look at it at the end of it and find myself thinking these guys are much different to the way I thought they were. Sure. I agree with that. Um, conversely, like the co-main event, I think uh, we can talk about it a bit more later, but like I had the greed that uh, Lamosh is, that uh, Zhang is extremely counterable on the feet, and you had the much better read that <laughs> uh, Lamosh does not wrestle good. It wasn't even that. It was, I mean, the thing with me, with with... with... With Lamush is that I had a hard time telling how good her wrestling was because it was tough to, it was tough for me to say without a better grappling eye how much of her ability to win scrambles and stop takedowns was just down to physicality. Mm -hmm. And it turns out probably a lot because there were a yes. lot of easy takedowns. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, on the, for this one, I find it I find it tricky because it's one of those ones where like you want Aljo to be more aggressive spatially, but also the time when he did try being genuinely aggressive in this fight, he got instantly KO'd. Well, yeah, this is why I thought the idea would be uh, essentially like a gambit first round. Just go for it. Don't let Sean O'Malley warm up. Don't let him get a sense of range. Whatever, literally do what you did to Corey Sanhagen. In that mm -hmm. fight, he got in his face and pushed him into the fence and took him down in like 15 seconds. He was all over him. And Aljo has done that in plenty of fights. He often starts super fast and just tries to test somebody's um, defensive wrestling right away. I thought, sure, why not do that here? Uh, mm -hmm. Just go out there. And then, if that doesn't work... You can probably afford to try to be patient and break him down. Instead, he kind of found himself in this very unhappy medium where he didn't press at all the first round, uh, really, until the very end. And stalled out on a takedown, but got a little work done. And then in the second round, this was the first time in the fight when he had decided um, that he wanted to try to actually bridge that gap, he had done nothing to establish the way he tried to cover that distance. And the only way you get away with that, with having no like diligent setup, no uh, expected reactions uh, or expected movements that you can work off of as you, you know, methodically press your way through range, is if you surprise the guy early. Like waiting one round and then trying to rush him with a bunch of wild punches, just hoping that he's not going to notice any of the obvious openings you're giving him. That to me is a bad idea. Just plainly a bad idea. Uh, just a bad strategic execution, I think, on Aljo's part. Um, yeah, I find it. I mean, I, again, I find it like tricky to to say this kind of stuff in the in the aftermath because. You could say the same thing about uh, like uh, Aldo McGregor, let's say. Like McGregor was someone who always would take the initiative in his fights and would build from there when he was good. Um, and yeah, Aldo, Aldo comes out 
and tries to press him and then immediately gets KO'd. Yeah. So I can see why Sterling did not necessarily want to repeat that dynamic by coming out and then immediately running face first into a giant puncher. Sure. Um, so, I mean, you know, I can't, can't fault him that much for having like a relatively empty first round and then trying to push it in the second and then just getting KO'd. I mean, it, in some ways, you know, it just happens every now and again. You're just gonna run in. It's a peach of a counter. Oh, beautiful. It was literally the Conor McGregor counter. Mm hmm. Like it's, just, it's, you know, right handed. Yeah, yeah, it was just a right handed version. It was, I mean, uh, how fitting, I suppose, that Sean O'Malley was like, I don't know, like 19 years old when Conor McGregor was rising, something like that. Younger even probably, because what is he? No, he's like 28 now. Um, and, you know, had been spending his entire uh, useless life up to that point being like, I'm going to be famous. And then he saw Conor McGregor being famous and instantly made the decision that I'm going to be him, but with pink hair. Uh, like, seriously, how fitting that he literally delivered McGregor's signature shot to mm -hmm. to win the title here. That uh, just maintaining distance, maintaining distance, opponent makes a terrible blunder, just like stumbling into the gap between you. You let him crash in, hop, step back. Off to a slight angle, line him up on the on the uh, cross. One hundred percent McGregor's signature move. Um, yeah, I mean, I see what you're saying with Aljo's approach. I mean, I I think a difference is that uh, th there is definitely a difference between trying to press an extended exchange uh, recklessly uh, than there is pushing a guy like positionally to the fence and immediately grabbing onto his legs. Um, but it, it's obviously a gamble, you know, but um, I think if you, if you don't do that, then you can't, you can't be making the gambles later after you've allowed him to settle in and get comfortable. Like was the idea that O'Malley was going to have a slower second round as he often does? Cause if that was the idea, then you have to press him and make him work to get him there mm -hmm. to tire him out before he can get another wind. Um, and, and basically like, yeah, the, the entry Aljo tried in round two was itself a huge gamble. And I would say a much worse one because, uh, he hadn't done anything to make O'Malley uncomfortable at all. And. It just was not a good entry is, is all like it was just a bunch of he didn't have any sense of his range. He was just throwing blindly, leading with his head. That's not good. <laughs> That's, that is not good. Um, way better, I would say, to just stay back and, and focus even more on kicking his legs. I mean, why not? Mm -hmm. That was going fine. I mean, wasn't decisively winning, wasn't decisively losing either. Why not do that? Make O'Malley make a risky decision. Um, that's all I'm saying. If you're gonna make a big, a big, take a big swing like that, do it immediately. I'm not saying you have to do it; that that's like the best idea necessarily. But do it right away when the guy's cold, and you can take him out of his game and start wearing on him, or maybe finish him like you did to Sandhagen. Yeah, I mean, I just think like the the mental pressure of being someone who gets mean KO'd instantly is is like it's a very difficult thing to sure yeah uh, to get past. And and I will say uh, this that you could tell from body language that Sean O'Malley he was looking for a step knee to knock Aljamain's block off in the first round. Uh -huh. There were a couple of instances where he fainted or Aljo fainted, and you can see him take that little stutter step to load up. The, basically the very knee that he, he hurt uh, Piotr Jan with in their fight. So, like, yeah, obviously he was – of course he was expecting a takedown. But uh, I just I just think if you're going to get knocked out the way Aljo did, it's it's more likely to happen when it did than it is to happen immediately. Yeah, maybe. I mean – yeah, I think it's just difficult to, to, to go back and look at the, you know, you, you never know what could have happened. Maybe he just would have gone out and got sure, sure. blobbered immediately. I mean, I think the main thing is if you want to tire someone out, you, you, 
if you've got a game plan to tire someone out, you might want to stick to it for longer <laughs> or yeah. to build up additional damage. Yeah, I mean, yeah, empty he, rounds. I think that that would have been uh, the fight showed a pretty effective alternative. Just kick at his legs a lot because uh, he landed several good low kicks. Al- O'Malley doesn't check them, you know, and his legs are all fucked up. He's got the legs of a man twice his age. So just go after his legs. I mean, why not? Yeah, I, I don't mean to take everything away from um, Sean O'Malley here. I just, I was a little confused by Alja's approach. Like, what was his preparation for this very distinct type of opponent if this is what we got? Um, O'Malley's approach made perfect sense to me. Because he didn't want to be, even more so than in other matchups, he didn't want to be crazy aggressive. He didn't want to, I mean, half of the strikes he throws leave him badly off balance. It's all about that initial timing, as it was for McGregor. And I think he lacks McGregor's athleticism to maybe recover from and improvise in the positions those uh, deliberately overthrown shots put him in. So he's really got to be precise in that moment of like first contact with the opponent. And he was basically just patient. And he did a lot of the things that we praised him for, you know? He didn't get, he didn't make it easy at any point for Aljo to corner him. His cage craft and footwork were quite good. Huh? He, he was himself just sort of stabbing away at the body, doing what he could at that long range. And essentially, yeah, just daring Aljo to make the first mistake and, and Aljo obliged. So Sean O'Malley's game plan, simple as it was, I think made a lot of sense and it worked. Yeah. Um, I think in terms of the the cage craft, he maybe didn't want to be backed up to the cage as much as he was. But as you said, like his footwork is actually pretty good, um, and yeah, he just does a good job of not just like mixing up the direction that he's going to escape off the cage, but by fainting changes of direction to get off the cage. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he is, I think, one of the rare fighters who is actually like. Uh, quite difficult to pin down there. Mm-hmm. You know, you compare it to, like, say, I don't know, Austin Poirier, who just circles the cage. Yeah. Many people will simply just go around the cage in one direction. But he was, you know, clearly thinking about which way he was going to go. He was laying traps where he would faint to go in one direction and come back out the other one. He was, as you said, he was, he was difficult to nail down. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think Sterling hit him in the face once. No, I don't think he did. I mean, you know, apart from the obvious glancing arm punches from the clinch. Right, which, right, right. You know, Not at range. Out. No, I think he, he caught yeah. his legs. He maybe caught him with a good body kick. I think that was about it. His his punches. And this is why the uh, the rush when it did come was so suicidal. Because, like, you got to touch the guy <laughs> with your mm-hmm. jab before you start swinging three-punch combinations at him. That is begging to get knocked out on the counter. You have yeah. to get your range. That is what the jab is for. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I wrote about this um, in the very specific context of O'Malley's fight with Jan in the article I did last week. If you haven't checked that out, you should check it out now. It's called Sean O'Malley, Better Than You'd Like, uh, on the Bloody Elbow Substack, exclusively. And... Uh, I wrote about his, uh, his positional fighting. I think it is one of the, it, it is the best part of his game is, is his footwork. And, uh, I think it, it honestly makes up a lot of the physical gap between him and Conor McGregor, who he so clearly idolizes and emulates with a lot of the other elements of his game. Um, that Sean O'Malley, it, he he can make you know when you surprise him he'll like leap back and 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 he will crash into the fence but typically he's quite difficult to corner and quite difficult to cut the cage off against because uh as you said he he is um he's very good at kind of drawing the opponent into committing to one direction with like footwork feints and then using that to slip out the other way uh, but the other thing that he does really well that so many MMA fighters could stand to learn from is that he circles in a threatening manner. Mm. He doesn't 
go defensive with his circling. It's not purely an evasive movement, um, right? Like fighting is this zero sum thing where every move you make can be an opportunity for your opponent. You know, every punch can be countered, every defense can be exploited or gotten around. So in in any game, in any uh, competition like this, the best moves are usually ones which are accomplishing both defensive and offensive goals at the same time. And that is why fighters with good positioning make their opponents feel like they're in hell even when they're not actively beating them up. Uh, and Sean O'Malley does a good job of this. He circles um, behind his jab. Like, even when he's not throwing it, as he's sidestepping away from you, you look, you're now at a worse angle, and you have the feeling, if I chase him, I'm going to run into his jab. Because it's there. He's pointing it at me. <laughs> um, and he often uses his jab to create sidesteps, but he all, even when he's not throwing it, he does a good job of um, of just remaining potent as he is evading, not yeah. just loping this is, along yes. the fence. And, and this is definitely something which McGregor was, in fact, genuinely pretty bad at. Exactly. Yeah. 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 This is uh, he is simply much better at it than him. It's something that um, yeah. Bobby Green is quite good at. Bobby yeah, Green will a spend a lot of fights pressed up close to the fence, but it's very difficult to actually corner and go to work on. Uh, and he has a less sort of orthodox boxing way of doing it with all the stance switching and everything. O'Malley switches stance too, but O'Malley has a, often a very classic boxing approach to uh, escaping the corner, which is to pivot and, with feints, with actual jabs, or merely in a threatening position so that his jab is always lined up and every step isn't just taking him out of your sights, it's also lining him up with the center of your body. So as he sidesteps, you don't just get to cut him off, you have to adjust, because otherwise you might get tagged. He's good at that. Um, it's a subtle thing that I wouldn't even expect a young fighter to be good at. It's a subtle thing that many, many MMA fighters are terrible at, which is why they like turn their backs and shit and run into the fence and get surprised when they're cornered because all they're thinking about is just getting out of the way. And you can't. You know? Fighters like fighters love when an opponent just runs away from them. You're literally helping your opponent. You're making them excited and confident when you are you just look like you're trying to escape. They like that. You have to outmaneuver them. Yeah. So, yeah. And then, yeah, they just chase you down like Sterling tried to against O'Malley. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a very, a very, very simple performance, really, from Sean O'Malley. Not a lot happened, but in, in that regard, it was kind of perfect. He didn't want a lot to happen. Um, and in yeah. typical fashion, both men have been saying, Awful things about who should be fighting next. Uh, no, Sterling has once again sounds like he might be trying to hang Marab out to out to dry by going for yeah. an immediate rematch. Well, which is, O'Malley said he doesn't want a rematch, and I very much doubt the UFC will give Sterling one. To be honest, yeah, but also he shouldn't even be saying that. No, uh, you you told your boy you were going to move up after this. He told his boy he was going to move up after Henry Cejudo. Yeah. Like, doing it once is pushing your luck. Yeah. Doing it twice is being a dick. I, like, I, I do agree. A I genuine like, dick. I like Aljo, and I don't particularly hold it against him for having the feeling of wanting to keep what's his, or get back what's his, but, you know... This is the position you've put your teammate in by sharing a division with him, and he, you know, out of it's incredibly, he's been honor. incredibly gracious about yeah. the entire thing, and has been very like, honorable in like in accepting second position. Definitely, it's time for Marab to get a shot. Yep. The other, the thing that people have, uh, you know, one of the things that people have shat on Aljo for has been his uh, his apparent liking of like Andrew Tate. Yeah. 
but one of uh, you know one of those things is they're always like banging on about what it is to be a man or whatever uh-huh uh i don't know what he says but no, nothing you know, particular a man keeps his word to people that's you know? right if you're going to be one of these things where it's like you know oh people are soft nowadays or any, any of this kind of nonsense just like do things that you said you were going to do to your, you know, do things that you said you would do for your friends when they were kind That's to right. you. That's right. Yeah. And, yeah, I'm, and O'Malley being like, I'll defend against Cheeto in December. I bet you would love to do that. Yeah. <laughs> no. No, he should fight Marab no. and lose to him. <laughs> he, can, he can fight Marab. He can fight Sandhagen. He, he's, Cheeto yeah. he should not get a fucking title. Show. I I do I do agree. A win over Pedro Munoz and uh, just is that his? Did he is he on a one fight win streak? Was the Sandhagen fifty forty five domination the last fight before that? Ooh, I think it was right. I think so. Let's see. I'm completely forgetting. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, sorry. Split decision. Yeah. I forgot about that. You forgot. <laughs> Shameful. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, che- che- Two che- incredibly che- deserving che- title contenders. Don't turn this this into welterweight again, please. Che- Cheeto's got a better case than most in the division, but he doesn't have a better case than Marab and Sandhagen, who beat him. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but I mean, whatever, you know. It's, yeah, the, the Aljo thing I fully agree with. I like Aljamain Sterling. You know, I really do not yeah. understand, uh, you know, beyond the obvious why so many MMA fans and fans in Boston <clears throat> uh, have an issue with him. But, uh, yeah, he should step aside. You know, he may not, I, again, I don't think he'll have a choice, but it is a little annoying that he is like trying to make the case for a rematch. It's like, meh. you know, yeah. they uh, asked him, I at think, the, you know, they asked him at the post fight presser, you know, you said you were going to go to featherweight and he's like, I don't know. I just got knocked out. I don't, I wonder what those featherweights hit like. And first of all, your chin's going to be better. All right. I'm telling you, you cut less weight. You're going to find that shots just don't hurt you as bad. But secondly, come on, man. <laughs> you said you were going to do it. Don't go back on that. Yeah, Matt Serra and Rain Longo, great coaches. And they, at this point, they need to do one of the things that coaches have to do. And yeah. they need to have words with two of their fighters. They need to say to Aljo, you said you would do this. You said you would step aside. Yeah. Be a man of his word and do it. I need to talk to Chris Weidman. <laughs> you, yeah. Well, we will get to that later. Possibly that will be reserved for a bonus episode on the Patreon, but I do want to talk about it. There's just a lot to talk about in this card. What do you say we take a break? Uh, big congratulations to Sean O'Malley. Please fight Marab. <laughs> I'd rather have Marab as champion. But hey, respect, I guess. Um, let's take a break. And when we come back, we will talk about the women's strawweight title, another one that we just chef kiss, just nailed it. Um, and then we're going to talk about Ian Gary and Neil Magny. We'll probably talk about Chito, Chito Pedro Munoz. And there was a lot more on the prelims of this card, which will almost certainly go on a bonus episode before we uh, we get to uh, Holloway versus uh KZ next week. All of that after this. Hey everybody, thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. Welcome back to Heavy Hands. We're talking about the Women's Strawweight Championship. It was on the line in the co-main event of UFC 292. Zhang Weili 
holding the line against power punching challenger Amanda Lemos. Phil, explain yourself. Uh, I don't feel like I was wrong in saying <laughs> Wei Li Zhang <laughs> is going to get countered cleanly. No, you were right. Because she did almost every time Amanda Lemos threw one of the three total strikes that she threw uh, in this I fight. Actually, this is They're actually, all connected. Yeah, I actually feel this is pretty typical of our incorrect picks in that we were not wrong about a lot of the particulars, but there was one sort of, we just didn't give enough weight to one very specific factor. Um, first of all, I think some of the credit for that, for the surprising one-sidedness of this fight, has to go to Zhang Weili, who very clearly had an excellent game plan. Mm-hmm. Um, in yeah. fact, I um, think someone I... Someone on yes. Twitter, yes. I believe uh, it's... Uh, a collection of letters and numbers that maybe spells Ghost 21. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, did a sort of Wei Li Zhang scouting report, uh, which is a fantastic analysis. I highly recommend. I think they intimated that they yeah. did that, that they were involved with her camp. Yeah. They were revealing In, what they said. Either way, yeah, they were like, this, yeah, this is her, this is her actual scouting report. Yeah. They were like, yeah, this is a multi step game plan. Built around throwing away punches, uh, trying to get her to pull out the right hand counter. Um, how she responds to uh, like body kicks and uh, and yeah, her her tendency to grip fight in the clinch, like pretty much everything. Uh, yeah, and it just it's a it's a great thread, and it it certainly like matches up very well. And as I recall, the, the scout gave a a shout out to uh, to the man Jack Slack, which was nice as well. Oh, that is cool. Yeah, they were like Jack Slack's uh, writings uh, inspired a lot of the way I thought about this matchup. So the uh, the the armchair analysts get <laughs> getting some love from uh, from the actual uh, the people actually involved in the camps. Um, yeah, and her game plan was excellent, and you know, like everything was really built around we are going to out wrestle Amanda Lemos and thrash her on the ground. And everything involved in the striking was really just kind of how to get there, how to um, how to draw certain openings by by leading with punches, particularly leading with the right hand to draw out a big wild counter that she could level change under, um, and uh, and just how to make it more difficult for her to get her timing. You know the importance of fainting, the importance of I think this this the scout in this case called them false entries. I like that term. Okay. Um, and just how to sort of confuse Lamosh and take advantage of the fact that we acknowledged that Lamosh is very much a one and done puncher. Um, and that if you can sort of sort out when those one punches are coming um, and make them come when you want them to, you're going to have a much easier time working around them. But as you said, when Lamosh, in the few moments in this fight when she did have space, she was landing that right hand on Zhang Wei Li. Mm-hmm. Like she landed clean several times. Um and uh, certainly appeared to have a great fourth round, although it's not even clear that she won it. But uh, I think it was largely because Zhang Wei Li was taking a break from beating her ass <laughs> that yeah. she got that round at all, because otherwise she was getting crushed, absolutely crushed, and largely through the wrestling, but also with a beautiful counter as she was trying to get it back in uh, in round five. Um, just to, yeah, as it often does, like getting badly out wrestled clearly just yeah. had obliterated her sense of distance. Yeah. So yeah, her success early in the fight was things I was broadly expecting. Her, any of her success late in the fight was mostly like her just lunging forward, desperately trying to punch Zhang Weili from a very long way away. Yeah. Which occasionally, yeah, did work. Cause as I said, uh, again, this is like one of the cool things in that. In the uh, Ghost Twenty One thread, is that like they were like we know Zhang Weili is, is vulnerable to getting punched in the face. Yeah, like they were uh, like they, they're not uh, mincing any words about you know her being uh, defensively vulnerable. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and when she uh, frequently, whenever she just sort of like lazily jabbed her way in on the edge of range, yeah, she would just get beamed with her right hand over the top. Um, but she also caught basically all the kicks that came her way or countered them. I think that was the what resulted in the knockdown in round five. Um, yeah. She ducked under, level changed under a lot of Lamush's bigger swings. Um, and she just had a really varied takedown approach, too. We had inside trips. We had uh, high crotch, like crackdown finishes. We had like back trips from the body lock. We had everything. And um, she just had a huge, I mean, I, th- this didn't just sort of rev- uh, crystallize my understanding of how good Lamush's wrestling actually is. I think it improved my <laughs> impression of Zhang Wei Li's wrestling. Yeah. I mean, 100% for me. She was not just cheating her way to the ground here. There were a lot of great takedowns. Yeah, it it reminded me of, you know, the things that people have said about her, that she's just an incredibly diligent student Yeah, who just vacuums up information when she's uh, she's training. And, you know, I think probably argue reasonably argue that her stand-up game has stagnated a little at this point. Sure. I think that's what I was sort of over-fixating on. Um, but yeah, that was a complete-looking wrestling game. Yeah. And, like, the Esparza fight, she easily out-wrestled Esparza. You could point to it and just be like, well, she's twice as big and Five times as athletic. Yeah. But this time you can just be like, well, I mean, you could, okay, you could, you could make the case that the difference is simply that, you know, uh, what, uh, what Lemosh brings in athleticism, she lacks in technique. But again, that would be, uh, I think that would be, that would be false. This is a genuinely, uh, this is a genuinely improved fight from the one who got out-wrestled by Nami Yunus. Yeah, well, if you're on, like, physical parity with each other, you'd better have great wrestling to be able to, to, to if you want to do something like this. Mm-hmm. It has to be, um, it has to be layered and technically sharp. And not just the, I mean, the transitions between takedowns and the grappling, um, the grappling itself, like, Lamosh just had a nightmare of a time getting back to her feet. Every time she tried to get her feet involved, She would get stacked, and that would usually lead to a pass. There were a couple of what I thought of as, like, typical athlete things that Zhang Weili did. There was one moment in the fight, maybe in round three, where she hit what felt like a completely improbable back take. I was sure she was losing a scramble, and we'll see if it comes up while we're talking so I can refresh my memory on what the particulars were. But largely, she was just technically superior on the ground. She was controlling wrists when she was in any kind of ride or like half guard position. So she could work the free hand, very reminiscent of Khabib's groundwork, especially when she had Lamosh up against the fence. And the thing I think I enjoyed the most, uh, aside from the, you know, thrashing she was giving her whenever they went to the ground, her clinch was phenomenal. Like there were multiple times uh, and we will proceed to give credit to Lamush for creating these moments by just refusing to give up and continuing to fight her way back to her feet. But it was just like hell because Lamush would put in all this work to like get to the fence, struggle her way back to her feet, all this effort uh, while getting hit, you know, while being threatened with other takedowns. And it it led her to the clinch where Whaley just continued crushing her. It was like a nightmare for her because the ground was this horrible thing she had to escape and she still couldn't get Zhang off of her. Her head positioning in the clinch was flawless. She was con- repeatedly controlling wrists or using her wizard um, and fighting for head position. She landed a ton of elbows, some excellent, very precise knees to the body from these positions. And usually these led very quickly back to a trip takedown of some kind. Just brutal. And precise. 
I think that that is an area where I think Whaley has always been very dangerous. You know, I think going back to the sure. uh, Andrade KO, right? Of course. Uh, that was the one where it was like, oh, one of these, you know, again, it was like, these people are both super athletic, but one of them is actually good here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that was but yeah, like her, her ability to fight, fight with, uh, a fight, a fight with a parity in the clinch with, uh, Yuan and Jajik. Yeah. That too. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, now that it's, now that it's chained to a, a dangerous wrestling game, uh, again, I think you can look at Zhang's striking and be like, I think this is probably the area which is the, yeah, probably the most stagnant part of her game, but the the improvement of her wrestling makes her much more it synergizes very well with what she is already very good at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all she needs are you know the the kicks she's got to to control the range. She used that side kick very well to drive Lamosh back. Um, when Lamosh did pull the trigger on her a couple times, she she did what we expected. Came uh, Zhang came back with counters in combination huh? to, to to keep Lamush on the back foot. And um, as I said, almost any time Lamush lifted up a leg to kick or knee, it was immediately grabbed, and that was converted to a takedown. Every time Lamush got up to her feet, she got stuck in the clinch, which was usually converted back into a takedown. Uh, I thought Whaley's guard passing was phenomenal. <laughs> Just... Um, like a, a damn near perfect performance. When's the last time we've seen a championship fight be this one sided? Hmm. You mean as in one that went like five rounds? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think of like an instant KO as being as one sided as. Like um, Makachev against Oliveira, for example. Sure. Yeah. That's stuff like um... that or like McGregor, Alvarez. Like these are very one sided fights too. Mm -hmm. But just like, this is like a GSP style, I'm just going to spend the entire fight winning. Completely okay. winning. As, and she has two very interesting title, very different potential title contenders next. Yeah, what do you uh, think about those? That's either going to be Yan Jiaoman, which is going to be a test of basically... A similar test to Lamosh, I think, but a even a more coherent but less athletic version of that test, mm -hmm. or just Tatiana Suarez, which is just completely the opposite thing. Yeah, like this is just not going to be the path to victory against this person at all. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, Suarez is probably the, in the more interesting one. I think Jamal is probably at this point the one who deserves it more. Yeah, I mean, do you have a particular feeling on them? I, I, I certainly do. I mean, part of this is mm. just me riding high on the back of this. I'm I'm very impressed with Zhang Wei Li at the moment, but I kind of find it. Hard. I almost feel like while well, while I could more easily see um, Yan Shanan getting just crushed due to physical gap, I almost feel like the dynamics of that fight are give her more opportunities to make something happen. Because she's a pretty diligent, uh, high output fighter with good uh, striker with good counters, you know, decent footwork enough that she's constantly moving and changing angles. I think she could perhaps test some of the gaps in in Zhang striking. Suarez, I've just not been impressed with her since her return. I, I have, and I don't know. I'm, I don't expect that I would be, but um, God, her striking is bad. Mm -hmm. And her transitions as a result to wrestling or, or, or methods of getting into range, just not good. And yeah. she's super yeah. vulnerable it's on every break. She doesn't look particularly good in the clinches. Like, it's just the mat wrestling, even more than the takedowns, are impressive. Everything else is feels very lacking. Yeah, and I'm not sure that she's even as uh, assertive and physical as she was before. No, it doesn't life. feel like it. Maybe some of Still, that is... Still, like a very, a very interesting, I think, style matchup. You know, uh, for Zhang, it's, it may be the first person 
that he fights that is simply bigger and stronger than she is and has who has a genuine technical game. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'd watch it. But, uh, yeah, I've just not been sold on Suarez since her return. I, I agree. She she looks less assertive. Some of it might be ring rust. Um, but it's just like lesser opponents uh, seem to be like making her look very awkward. <laughs> very, very awkward. And Zhang Wei Li, forever, whatever her faults on the feet, she's fast. She throws in combinations. She moves her feet. She's got a full range of striking tools offensively. I think she could probably have like a terrible striking match and just win comfortably if she wanted to. Mm -hmm. Seem like the sort of logical thing to pick. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I suppose we should take another break. Um, when we come back, we're going to talk about Max Holloway, Korean zombie. And I will urge you once again to head over to our Patreon because we're going to be talking about some more of these UFC 292 undercard fights, of which there are many uh, after this. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support Heavy Hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are, but no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. You can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve, so thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. All right, welcome back to Heavy Hands. Finally, we wrap things up with a preview of next week's Fight Night card. Um, looks good. Looks fine. Not amazing, but I have been um, force-fed like a, like a foie gras goose. I have been force-fed so many Apex cards, so much corn slurry at this point, that uh, really anything that isn't that is like, it, it may as well be, give me a McDonald's hamburger patty and I feel like I'm eating New York Strip. And uh, for that reason, like an abused housewife, I will take this. I don't know if I will take this. I mean, for two reasons. One, I'm still half convinced that at some point, away or zombie, even though they're not the people who do this, will get injured and drop out. And because the gods want more Anthony Smith main events. Yeah still Ooh, they, i have that feeling they put smith but, on the car didn't they yeah, yeah you know that if, if these guys weren't on it a hundred percent smith span two wasn't his was his last fight with span a main event must have been surely it would actually you have to look yeah it, it was it was <laughs> yeah, it was. So, sorry, Ryan's fan. I don't mean to be mean. <laughs> Man, I look back at um, that card. That's from 2021. It looks so good. It's just a bullshit fight night card, and it looks so good. It followed relevant fighters that you remember. Armin Sarukin was on there. Joaquin Buckley was on there. Raquel Pennington, mm -hmm. Montel Jackson, Aaron Blanchfield. That's like a real card. And we probably uh, complained about it at the time. <laughs> you've managed to look back at a Anthony Smith card and make yourself <laughs> feel sad about the Max Holloway headlined card that we have coming up. <laughs> oh my god. It's better from top to bottom. At least it's got Max Holloway, but it, otherwise it's better. <laughs> that is mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyway. Yeah, so that's one of the reasons... Yeah. So I'm just like, no, it's it's got to be an Anthony Smith main event. The other reason is that, like, the, the, yeah, this fight does make me sad. I know you said it doesn't make you sad, but... Uh, I get it's it. It's one of those fights where, like... I don't see a good outcome coming out of it for anyone. It's, it's so existentially meaningless. Yeah. Because obviously there's, you know, the main thing that should happen is that... Max Holloway is going to uh, fuck the Korean zombie up. Is it's, uh, it's one of these fights where he was 
he's mu- he was much better at his peak. I do think he is on the decline now. Um, but uh, even uh, at a side, Zombie has declined much more than Max Holloway has. Here's the thing. Uh, so- Here, here's the thing that I will say. Chan Sung Jung's last fight that made him look horribly, horribly, horribly declined was against Alexander Volkanovsky. Is that guy good? He's pretty good. And Max Holloway did not really look better than the Korean zombie in his last fight with Alexander Volkanovsky. Fair enough. I don't think Korean zombie... Uh, look, I think there are matchups, because he didn't look good in his fight with Brian Ortega. You know? Uh, I think there are matchups that make him look bad, for sure. But I don't, I don't think he's as shot as it seemed. That was just hard to watch because everybody loves Korean Zombie and Volkanovsky just turned him into a paste, just obliterated him. But if Max Holloway didn't have a better chin, he would have suffered exactly the same fate because Volkanovsky's rubber match with Holloway was every bit as one sided. So Mm -hmm. I'm, I just, that's the only reason I'm not amazingly depressed. Like I, to me, these are, Two fighters, one of whom was better before, yes. Both of whom are past their prime. Yeah, I think Korean Zombie's probably a little more past it. Um, but I don't think he, I, I don't know if he's shot shot yet. His fight with Dan Ige was good. You know, that was the one just before uh, the Volkanovsky fight. Granted, even these were years ago. Years ago now. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, I get it, but, uh, I, I, I just think ba- basing the, oh, he's, he's done. He shouldn't be fighting anymore off of a one-sided loss to Volkanovsky, who then went on to crush the guy he's fighting as well is, is a, is a little, it doesn't fully convince me. Yeah. I mean, it's the fact that he, uh, zombie struggled greatly with, I think, a like good style matchup in against Danny Gay. Yeah. Well, as you said, he's been sort of crushed by people who can, by um, uh, what's his? Why did I suddenly Ortega. his name? Uh, Ortega, yeah, who who does a sort of ersatz version of what Holloway is settling into? Um, it's just like such a clear style dynamic that again, I don't know what any outcome of this fight tells me. It's yeah, yeah. By if Holloway wins as I expect him to, it's simply treading water. Yeah. Oh, um, it absolutely is that. I agree. If he, if Zombie wins, like, it says very, kind of says pretty bad things about where Max Holloway is, honestly. Probably. It would be, it means that either his, I mean, what it probably means is that his chin is finally gone because it would require Zombie to hurt him really badly and then either knock him out or submit him. I, I mean, I would be... On the it's, other hand, if Zombie manages to win a decision against Max Holloway... That's a very bad sign for Max. Yeah, I mean, any kind of win... That's the thing. Any kind of win for Zombie, it's really hard to look at it and think uh, that it, it doesn't just say that Max Holloway is done. Well, what's the alternative? I mean, what are you wanting? Are you wanting a fight that puts Max Holloway back in the title picture? Are you wanting a fight that puts Korean Zombie back in the title picture? Or do you want to feed them to prospects? Those are your alternatives. Contender fights. I would, or... feed them to, I would rather feed Max Holloway to more prospects than have these two fight each other. To be honest. Yeah. The thing is, he's probably going to beat. A, he's probably going to beat a lot of the prospects too, because he's just that cagey and and tough. You know. Yeah, but um, yeah, I would I would rather see it because at least you will you learn things. We learn something about Holloway versus. Alan. Okay, I get that. I'm I'm okay um, with I a treading think, water I don't think fight. we can learn anything from this that isn't depressing. I suppose so. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. I, I'm okay with a... I agree that it's a, a treading water kind of matchup. I'm just fine with it. Like, you got two name fighters. I, I don't think either of them are probably contending for the title again. So, like, yeah, fine. Have them fight each other. It's whatever. Yeah. I don't know. It's also the fact that, yeah, the, the zombie has been looking more fragile and that... Holloway has, by this point, absorbed an insane amount of strikes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it just leaves me a little uncomfortable. I mean, I think a... our, our read on how the fight play, plays out is probably pretty similar. 
As you said, um, Brian Ortega had a, a really nice disciplined outboxing performance to beat Korean Zombie. Um, I think largely from Southpaw and largely using the Southpaw jab. Uh, he just kept him at bay, uh, found little moments to pressure in off of that threat, but, but for the most part, he just stabbed him from really, really far away. And yeah, Max Holloway has for some, for some time now, um, even before I think the second fight with Volkanovsky has been, um, <clears throat> not, not every fight as insistent on being just the, insane swarming avalanche pressure fighter that he was when he got to and held the title. The Edgar fight is probably the yeah. the first and most clear example of this. But there were yeah, there were points of this even in, in things like the the Pettis fight was honestly one which was much more measured than I sure. thought it was. So it's always been in his tool set. I think it's just something that he wants seeing, to do a lot more now. We're seeing it more and more now. That fight with Arnold Allen um, we saw a bits of this in, and, and including a more varied approach against Yair Rodriguez, who ultimately I think forced Holloway to, to just bite down and pressure him a lot because otherwise he was getting shredded with the kicks. Um, but against Arnold Allen, who, who is a pretty slow paced fighter, Holloway did not take that as a, as any kind of invitation that he could, he could just completely overwhelm him. He was pretty happy to have a, uh, like fencing match from long range. And I think he's, he's certainly got a more, you know, he's just better than Brian Ortega. He's got a better feel for the angles. He's got a much more varied output. Um, he's possibly worse defensively, <laughs> if that's possible. So I think there are still opportunities in a fight like that for Korean Zombie to land some really big shots on him. Max Holloway has never been a very good defensive fighter. He's sort of like, he's like Ioana and Jacek in that way. You kind of, huh. you get impressed by so many aspects of his technical game. And then you're like, oh, like your main defense is just like hitting the guy first before he can hit you or hitting him back or just making it so he, he can't get any shots off at all. Cause otherwise yep. it's just stepping back, leaning back, kind of hunkering down into your shoulders. There is not a systematic sort of defense built into Holloway's striking game. So that is for sure. But you know, one of the things that uh, that generally have to chase him out of the pocket to take an ex uh, take full advantage of that. Yeah, unless you are, uh, unless you're Volkanovski, you can just build an approach out of the feints and the low kicks and the step in to sort of disable his ability to rain punishment on you on the way in. Um, uh, zombie can do that. Can chase people out of the pocket. Uh, it is one of the things he likes to do other than just countering people on the way in. Um, and... I, I'm just not sure how much he's willing to do that anymore. Yeah, you know, because it's a very it's a very scary thing to do to like just just charge someone, and you know, zombie has indeed gotten knocked the fuck out for it mm -hmm. uh, against uh, Yai Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. Well, how much he's going to be willing to chase Max Holloway out of the pocket? Yeah, um, he is. I think someone who's always been very good and keyed in at, at uh, countering jabs entirely possible that he could get a clean cross counter on Max Holloway's uh, range finding tool. Sure, that was Volkanovski's main opening against Max. Mm -hmm. uh, but just in general, um, I find it very difficult to see how he's going to beat Max Holloway, given the fact that he's just really foot slow and Holloway is at his absolute best, just sort of building angular entries on mm -hmm. uh, people who aren't very mobile. Yep, I agree. Korean Zombie is more than ever a counterpuncher. It's what he likes to do. He's gotten pretty good at it. Um, it is precisely why performances like Brian Ortega's have been so one-sided. Mm. 
because he could not create his own openings. It's why a fight like the one he had with Yair Rodriguez was such a mess. Um, because he was forced to create a bunch of hideous, awful collisions. Um, and his technique there is not nearly as good as it is as a counterpuncher. So yeah, I, I expect, um, I'm curious about the openings he might find off Holloway's jabs, but I expect that Holloway is going to be fairly comfortable just not giving him all the openings he needs. Mm-hmm. And Holloway has always been, and e- even within this, this more laid back style is still very good at, um, confusing his opponent's timing and finding ways to draw either small or large reactions out of them and then expanding on that finding a little opening and forcing an open with a sudden uh, a sudden flurry of shots coming in from different angles, using his feints, using his jab. Um, there's just a lot of ways for him to go where Korean Zombie is more limited as a striker. I, I don't have a particular feeling on... I mean, I've always been amazed by Zombie's grappling. I think it's far and away like the best aspect of his game it has been for a long yeah. time. I don't have a particular feeling on his takedown game or how likely it seems that he'll be able to force Holloway into that. doesn't seem particularly likely to me. Um, if anything else, just because I think it's going to be hard for him to track Max down. Yeah. Um, in general, I think Holloway uh, has really... F- the only wrestler he's really fought has been... Um, been you know a rather undersized Frankie Edgar, uh, but you know you can tell he's he's very diligent about fighting grips. Most of Koreans these takedowns against Dan Ige, which is most wrestling heavy performance, were all clinch fighting. I think Volkanovski um, counts I as did, a as a good wrestler and as well, and he he didn't have any sustained wrestling or grappling success against Max. In general, um, Holloway is one of those people. I think is just a, a naturally quite good grappler. Yep, you could tell that he, you know, as when he seemingly learned how to defensively wrestle in like the course of several months between fights, where he he got right. uh, out wrestled by Poirier and maybe someone else, and then just like, oh yeah, I can learn how to do this, and then just stuffs Dennis Bermudez yep. how many times, and he does not waste uh, time um, in any kind of tie up or clinch. I mean, he is very very diligent and methodical. At getting in his frames, getting his overhook, constantly improving his position. It's just, un- unless you hit him with an instantaneous takedown, like even if you're Volkanovsky, who literally out-wrestled Islam Makachev in the clinch at times, even he was not able to uh, blow Max Holloway off his feet suddenly enough that Max couldn't get his frames and his grips in and start creating angles and slipping out. So just really, really hard to out-wrestle Max. So my main feeling is that this uh, fight is just going to be Holloway steadily chewing <laughs> yeah. uh, Zombie up. I don't think, he, as I said, I think he's his slightly sort of lower pace and more cautious style is that he's probably not going to finish him. I think this is mostly uh, mostly what we learn, I think, from this fight is a referendum on how shot Zombie is. If he's not very shot, I think he will last to the final bell, and he will land at least one giant bomb on Max. And if he is shot, he'll just get dominated. Yeah, I agree. Okay, well, I'm more depressed about it now than I was before, if that's any consolation. Good, join me. Yeah. (laughs) Especially... Me being able to depress you about a Anthony Smith fight is a surprising and delightful bonus. Yeah, the the extreme disorientation I experienced when I looked back at a card from just two years ago with an Anthony Smith main event. Longing for those halcyon days of Anthony Smith versus Ryan Spann 1. (laughs) This is gold. This card looks amazing. (laughs) Yeah. All right, well, that's the show. Find us on Twitter at Evil Greg Jackson at Boxing Bush. Check out the Patreon. We're going to have a pretty lengthy bonus episode up there where we talk about the UFC 292 prelims. And come back and join us next week when we will be 
between this so-so Holloway card and looking ahead at an equally so-so, but for that, perfectly acceptable heavyweight main event card, Cyril Gaon, Sergei Spivak. I don't hate that. Ooh, Rose Nama Yunus is making her return next week. That'll be interesting. Hmm. Yeah. At flyweight. Mm-hmm. And I guess the well, well, the people up there are pretty bad. I don't know if it'll be fun to watch, but we will have a good time talking about it and trying to figure it out. And we hope you join that for us next week. Until then, if you came here today for the finer points of face punch and you came to the right place, this has been Heavy Hands.